Few can say they have been through more than the Irish. Centuries of British subjugation have only made way to more grief and bloodshed. But if there's one thing the Irish people are, it's resilient. And despite all the wars and revolutions, they have not lost their hope. But first, we must start at the beginning. The Seven Years' War was rampaging Europe, and as the years dragged on and on, it seemed as if the unthinkable would happen. Britain was losing. The British had promised quick victory. They would take Quebec in a year and sink the French Navy in five. This, however, had not happened. The French had withdrawn entirely from the war against Prussia, focused solely on the British and the colonies. They held strong in the St. Lawrence, and though the British Navy was stronger and larger, the French used Quebec as a bastion of resistance and managed to minimize losses at sea. So as the war strained Britain more and more, they used more extreme measures to extract resources from their colonies and their people. By the stalemate of 1759, Ireland was being used as the personal piggy bank of the British. They confiscated naval vessels, impressed sailors into the navy, and most critically of all, diverted critical food supplies from Ireland to the mainland. As the Emerald Isles began to starve, Britain did nothing but take and take. But unknowingly to the British, in their infinite pride and hubris, they would end up putting not just the war, but the future of the United Kingdom itself at jeopardy. There are many individuals who led to the rise of the April Revolution. There was the fighting priest Robert McConey, the peasant army led by Eamon O'Donnell, and dozens of other freedom fighters and rebels. However, this wasn't particularly new. There had been Catholic discontent in Ireland for centuries, and while the French took advantage of the rising discontent by funneling large amounts of arms and weapons to these groups, neither the King of France nor the King of England expected what was to come. On April 24, 1760, a small army led by Catholic priests and prominent Irishmen descended upon Dublin. They crashed through the city, opening fire on any Englishman they saw. They descended upon Dublin Castle before meeting the British army and easily being pushed back. They suffered major casualties and most of their leaders were executed, but despite the British army's quick response, the sheer unthinkableness of an Irish force nearly capturing Dublin, and no matter how one-sided the fight truly was, shook the nation. The French immediately started increasing their support tenfold, as it seemed as if the guerrilla forces in the countryside would evolve into a full-out revolt. The British diverted forces from North America to Ireland, hoping to quickly annihilate any rebel forces. They destroyed the largest rebel armies but found difficulty in dislodging the rebels in the remote countryside. The British took to massive reprisals in an effort to force the Irish into submission, but as the war turned into an occupation, the position became untenable. The French began advancing in North America, and the British were forced to move their forces back to stop the vital front from collapsing. The rebels immediately came back with a fervor, and it became clear to both sides what had truly happened. A new front had been opened, and it turned the stalemate into a complete crisis for the British. The Prime Minister was ousted and John Stewart began the work of dealing with the situation. By 1762, the entirety of Ireland, with the exception of Ulster, was de facto in rebel hands. The final blow came with the recapture of Dublin, which convinced the government that peace had to be made with France. The Treaty of London was signed, Britain would give up most of their colonies in India and the Hudson Bay, and the French would agree not to aid or recognize the Irish rebels. The French, however, would be very loose in their side of the deal. Under the guise of the Catholic Church, they would still funnel weapons to Irish rebels. By 1763, the Irish Catholic Front, which was the face of the revolt, was dependent on French aid, which was keeping them fighting in the increasingly brutal war. While French foreign policy has always been forceful, the days before Taliban would be better described as belligerent. The French flagrantly and openly violated the Treaty of London on multiple occasions, taking joy in kicking Britain while they were down. While they reveled in it in the moment, it risked grave consequences. Although the French had snuck a victory in the Seven Years' War, the British Navy still outnumbered the French, and the likelihood of a French victory in a protracted and total war against Britain was slim. By 1767, the British had overcome the initial shock of losing the war, and the Prime Minister made one thing clear. Any more flagrant violations of the Treaty of London would result in all-out war, and the French would have three months to rectify the situation. The prideful Bourbons were unwilling to stand down in the slightest, and so the Channel Crisis began. It seemed as if another war was looming, both navies began maneuvers, and the French truly had no idea just how much they were playing with fire. They began belligerently sending even larger armed shipments to Ireland, on some occasions not even bothering to remove French insignia from the shipments. A war was imminent, but the French once again escaped by the skin of their teeth. Right at the brink of war, the American crisis began, and the British were forced to divert their entire attention to prevent the 13 colonies from breaking away as well. 
The French sat smugly satisfied and took it out by further humiliating the British in Ireland. By 1770, there was no other choice. Ireland became free. The British may have been powerless to stop it, but they would never forget what the French did to them in their darkest hour. But for now, Ireland remained free, though even that was questionable. The Irish Catholic Front had won the war, but they were entirely dependent on the French for their continued rule. While the French were savvy enough not to dare put a Bourbon king on an artificial Irish throne, the Irish state was essentially ruled from Paris. The National Council was a combination of pro-French landowners and Catholic bishops, with the chief overseer as essentially a puppet position. Ireland owned hundreds of thousands of francs to the French, something nearly impossible for the new nation to pay off. As a result, the French offered predatory loans to the Irish, which only caught them further and further in a spiral of debt. Meanwhile, the Catholic Church gradually became the mouthpiece of the French. The clergy began to rule in a state-sanctioned regime as stifling as the Protestant oppression of before. All for the interest of the large aristocrats and French merchants rather than the Irishmen who had been crushed down for so long. After years, it became indistinguishable from the British rule before. The false independence was simply a humiliating mark that the French left on the Irish, and the Irishmen were left all alone as their nation turned on them as well. The French helped to alleviate the worst of the famine, but while they reversed the worst of the British policies, they implemented their own that were equally cruel and uncaring. While the British ruled through sheer force, the French ruled through unspoken coercion. The Irish always had a choice on paper, it's just that the choice was between French domination and complete and utter ruin. By 1782, the situation was growing unbearable, and it was clear that change was in the air. Thomas Costello formed an underground movement known as the Irish Republican Alliance, and in the coming years, it would slowly grow to become the face of the Republican movement. It seemed as if the tenuous peace brought to the land was a facade, and that another conflict was brewing under the waters of the Emerald Isle. A future built not upon the church or the French, but the Irish. However, realizing this would be just as difficult as achieving independence in the first place. The French held the state in their hands, and the church held the people in theirs. It would take something to tip this balance. That something gradually became clear as the French supremacy began to waver. It seemed as if a free Ireland, no matter how elusive, was at least a hope. But until then, the church and state work hand in hand to rob the pockets of the people and send it back to their pseudo-colonial overlords. But no matter how battered after years of poverty and subjugation, the Irish people still remain proud in the face of those who wish to keep them as slaves. One can only pray that it will bring a better tomorrow rather than more senseless suffering. But the rotten seeds of truth began to spread.